All right. Uh, good morning, folks. Welcome back. Welcome to panel number three, uh, which is about mitigating groundwater model uncertainties. We have three great speakers um, to be on this panel um, that'll take a little bit of time to talk about their experiences with modeling. As you can see, we are a slightly smaller panel than some of the other ones, so um, feel free to contribute your feelings on groundwater uncertainties, as we will probably have a little time um, compared to some of the others. So uh, um, JT uh, Rieger it, from JPL will be joining us online because he was unable to, to make it. Um, but we'll start off this morning um, with Laura Condon from the University of Arizona. Great. Sorry. Okay, push this to advance. Okay, so um, I guess I don't really need much of a title. I was just going to talk a little bit about uh, frontiers in groundwater modeling. I'm... Uh, Generally, I would count myself as a computational hydrologist, so um, I build large-scale physically-based models of groundwater surface water interactions. And so we talked a lot about observations yesterday, so I was just going to talk a little bit about what's happening in modeling. Uh, so I think uh, this is just kind of the figure I have in my head of scale. This has been talked about a lot, especially this morning, that models are a way that we can bridge some of the scaling gaps we have, especially for uh, large-scale decision-making and trying to get for trying to be able to cover the really large scale systems we have, but also at a scale that's relevant for planning and decision making. Um, and also that's important if we uh, want to use physically based models that we can use them to try to understand better what's going on with processes. So I just put this figure up. I mean, you could have a lot of examples of this, but this is from uh, Tom Meixner, just illustrating the fact that if you look at the Western US, we have a lot of different recharge mechanisms that we might care about. So it's not just about getting the water balance right. It's about understanding what those mechanisms are. Um, at the large scale, we have kind of like three main approaches to groundwater modeling, I would say. So there's lumped parameter global water balance models. Uh, we also run land surface models globally. And now there's a lot more integrated modeling going on where we solve 3D variably saturated flow in the subsurface. And that's generally um, the first two we're doing globally. The last one we've started doing regionally in more like the past decade. Um, and the reason for that is because it's much more computationally intensive and computationally demanding. Um, so that's just an example of like all the things going on. I have kind of two examples of what's happening with integrated modeling uh, over large scales. So I work on modeling at the of the continental U.S. There's also a group uh, in Europe that's doing continental uh, modeling of, of all of Europe, and they're actually also coupled up to a weather model at a slightly lower spatial resolution. Um, there's also a, another mo uh, modeling group in Canada that does a lot of integrated modeling for a lot of different um, provinces in Canada. Um, so just some examples of like what we can do with this. Um, we can, if we simulate all of the groundwater, we can use it to interrogate uh, some of our more conceptual models that we use to try to understand water balances. So this was actually a, a comparison I did looking uh, with our continental simulations comparing to water table ratios, which is something that is used a lot in large scale modeling and just showing that like water table ratios really don't give you the answer. This is not a one to one scatter line. Um, here, uh, also using integrated models, we can do things like look at residence time distributions. This is really important for understanding flow paths, um, comparing to land surface behavior to see like contributions to transpiration, um, basically like all sorts of partitioning. Uh, this is, these are examples of things they're doing uh, in Europe with the Terce SMP model that I talked about. Uh, so really using this for more like short-term forecasting. So they do a lot of data assimilation and do actually real-time forecasting with this, coupled up with uh, a weather model. So really um, looking at how adding the groundwater storage into that system changes uh, moisture convergence and actually predictions across Europe. And uh, so that's kind of like a pitch of like what's going on in integrated modeling. Of course, there's a lot of limitations. So I think data has been mentioned a lot of times. Uh, I, point, I just have an illustration here for one year of simulation of our continental model. We can gather about 1.2 million observation points, like actual like in situ observation points. Uh, but if you're generating terabytes of outputs, then a million observations is a millionth of your outputs. Um, so that's just to kind of like highlight the scale of what we're dealing with. Also, um, we've talked about the increase in available subsurface data, like with the GLIMPS data set from Tom Gleason. Um, but that's actually not really like a huge advancement in terms of the number of in situ observations we have. So even if we have better gridded data 
datasets to build our models from. Um, we have to be really careful about what actually, how much actual data we have to use. So um, some of the Sky 10 stuff that was talked about yesterday, I think is really interesting. Um, also, I think that we still really don't know what's going on with long-term storage trends. This is a paper from Bridget Scanlon uh, where they compared GRACE from 2002 to 2014 with uh, various land surface models and then two global water balance models. So this isn't the integrated modeling that's not happening globally yet. And basically the point of this map is just to show that like not only are they getting different answers, they're like getting different directions in terms of storage trends. So really all over the place. Um, and even if we have GRACE to compare to for the most recent, um, you know, 10, 10 to 15 years, uh, we have huge uncertainty in what these storage trends should look like in the future and what the low frequency variability is of that. So I'm going past my time just That's a little since we have plenty of time. Um, okay, then we also talked about uh, human systems. So uh, there's a lot of examples for this. This is just a paper that came out recently that I thought was good that um, just kind of showed that the way hydrologists uh, like to think about hydrologic systems um, is like the typical global, wa uh, typical like water balance, water cycle figure that everyone has in their mind from elementary school. But really humans are dominating the hydrologic cycle all over the place and we're, we don't have the right model in our mind and we're not modeling these things correctly, really. Um, and so then this is just like two examples of like uh, what we can see with integrated models, showing um, on the left some recent work we did where we looked at pre-development shallow groundwater versus post-development shallow groundwater, just showing the impact this has on stream flows if you just take subsurface drying as its own, um, basically isolate that out from irrigation or anything else. Um, and then the last one is an illustration of something uh, that Manu also showed yesterday, um, showing that if we have pumping happening in our models and we have that irrigation happening in conjunction with uh, what's happening with our atmospheric forcing, so when it's dry we use more water, that the variability in the subsurface is completely driven by what the humans are deciding to do. Uh, that's what I've got. <laughs>